Welcome to MFTB Sports Channel and in today's video we're going to do a special about teams that never made it to the F1 grid. Well, all bar one, because one did make it but didn't last very long. Now this video has been brought along by the challenge of Andretti Global trying to get to the F1 grid. And despite having significant financial backing behind them and also backing from automotive giant Cadillac, the Andretti team just can't seem to break through the fourth wall and get onto the F1 grid, despite the approval originally of the FIA. It's even been made clear now by Greg Maffei, the boss of Liberty Media, that Andretti will never get onto the F1 grid as long as he's in charge. And it's now got to the point that Michael Andretti has had to forfeit the ownership of his own Andretti Global organisation in the hopes that removing himself may get his team on the grid. And this is despite having all of the resources in place with a new factory being built in America, taking over a new property in Silverstone and developing a chassis which will be finished by New Year in Cologne at Toyota's factory. And so that got me thinking of other F1 teams that got oh so close to an F1 entry, either as a new startup or buying the assets of an old team. But either way, these teams, for one way or another, never actually made it to the F1 grid, which should come as a huge warning to Michael Andretti and his eponymous team. And so the first one, logically, being that we've just spoken about Andretti, is the last failed USF1 entry, which was, funnily enough, called USF1. The team was supposed to compete in the Formula 1 World Championship from 2010 and was allegedly planning to have two bases, one in Charlotte, North Carolina and a European hub in Aragon in Spain. The team was fronted by Ken Anderson and Peter Windsor, who is still to this day a well-known Formula 1 journalist and the proposal was to be powered by Cosworth Engines, who at the time were the engine manufacturer for all the proposed new teams that were supposed to be entering in the mid-2010s. The plans for Windsor and Anderson was that they were going to run a USF1 team completely from the United States, with the aim of entering the 2010 season with two American drivers, and even got as far as a design process for a car, and taking over Joe Gibbs Racing's US headquarters, which was formerly the NASCAR team's home. Despite all of the hype, it was then alleged by Bernie Ecclestone in December 2009 that he had severe doubts about the team ever making it to the 2010 grid. Although Peter Windsor always denied that there was ever an issue and that they were planning to use the Christmas holidays to speed up the process and get back on track. Although all the hype was supposed to be for two American drivers, in November 2009, this was changed somewhat with Peter Windsor admitting that they may need two European based experienced drivers to speed up the process and get the team on the grid. And it came somewhat as a surprise in November 2009 when it was announced that Argentinian driver Jose Maria Lopez would be an F1 driver for them providing he could provide $8 million of funding. This was a warning sign for what was to come if the team needed $8 million from an Argentinian driver that had never driven in Formula 1 before. Honda test driver James Rossiter was also heavily linked with the team although it's believed that he never actually had a contract in place and it's probably just as well. And as the processes were going along, it started leaking out who, reportedly, the primary investors were. Peter Windsor confirmed that one of the primary investors in the team was an advertising agency who was called Goodby, Silverstein and Partners, along with investment from YouTube founder Chad Hurley. But unfortunately, it seems that's as far as they got, because in February 2010, there was reports going around that the team was strapped for cash, and wasn't going to make it to the grid. And this wasn't helped by their primary investor, Chad Hurley, reportedly pulling his investment. It soon became clear that things weren't rosy at the team. When the team asked the FIA if they could miss the first four races of the season and make their first appearance at the Spanish Grand Prix. And they were also prepared to allow Jose Maria Lopez to take his sponsorship over to the Campos Meta F1 team, who did successfully make it to the grid, just... It's reportedly at this stage that Bernie Ecclestone sent the FIA to go and do an inspection of the North Carolina workshop, where they found that nothing was as it should have been, with a team on the verge of an F1 entry, and serious question marks were then beginning to be asked about whether the team could even make it at all. The final nail in the coffin was when FIA delegate Charlie Whiting said that there was no way the team would be ready for 2010, and reportedly USF1 asked if they could defer their entry to 2011. And as a showing of their commitment, they were even reportedly willing to pay a seven-figure sum as a down payment to the FIA and the Formula 1 World Championship. But unfortunately, this wasn't acceptable and on March 2nd, 2010, 
all of the staff were released from their contracts, including lead driver Jose Maria Lopez. And that was the last we ever see of the USF1 attempts to get on the grid. Another team that tried to get on the F1 grid was Phoenix Grand Prix, who were also known as Dart. They were a British banking company that were trying to enter the F1 championship in 2002 and 2003, using the assets of the folded Pros Grand Prix team. They managed to outbid Minardi owner Paul Stoddart for the assets ahead of the 2002 Australian Grand Prix. And they were hoping to enter the F1 World Championship for the next round in Malaysia. And they were hoping to use a 2001 Pros chassis with Arrow's V10 engines dating all the way back from 1998. So as you can imagine, this would have been a car that was so far off the pace, it would have been unbelievable. But back in those days, you didn't have the pedigree of teams that you've got now, which are all financially stable and with a nice close grid. It was a regular occurrence to get drivers that fell out the 107% rule which nowadays would seem unbelievable. But Phoenix Grand Prix hit a snag straight away when it was debated whether there were the old Prost team that was repurchased or whether it was a new team that was using the assets. And when the FIA determined that they were in fact a new team, they were ordered to pay the governing body a $48 million entry fee. And as they hadn't done that in time for the start of the season, they were refused entry to the sport. F1 ringleader Bernie Ecclestone said that Phoenix Grand Prix had done nothing more than buy some show cars. But the team refuted this and still turned up in Sepang 2002, expecting to be on the grid. They not only turned up with their chassis and badly outdated engines, but they also had former Minardi drivers Tarso Marquez and Gaston Maxicane ready to pull out of the pit lane if they managed to get in. All of which was an embarrassing saga for F1 at the time. Phoenix even took the whole process to the high court, but they sided with the FIA and said that entries could not be bought or sold. And eventually this was the last we ever see of Phoenix Grand Prix. Which personally the saddest thing for me was seeing the back of the blue colour scheme of Prost as blue's my favourite colour. Another team that tried to get born out of the ashes of a former F1 team was Stefan Grand Prix. Which was born out of the idea of founder Zoran Stefanovic. Now Stefanovic is definitely a character that doesn't like the word no, as you'll see multiple times over the next entry. As he previously tried to get an entry into the sport in 1996 and tried to buy the assets of the Lola Mastercard team in 1997. He tried to be one of the new F1 teams to join in 2010 using Cosworth engines and competing with USF1, Virgin Manor and also Campos which would later turn into HRT. Stavanovic also maintained that they had the facilities to make their own car whereas other rivals were planning to outsource to outside suppliers and he also had the backing from former disgraced engineer Mike Coughlin which in itself didn't exactly go down well. But when his entry was rejected for a 2010 participation, he tried to attempt another route into the F1 grid when Toyota pulled the plug on its F1 team. And despite Toyota's resistance in selling their F1 team, eventually Stavanovic managed to secure the rights to run a 2010 chassis, gearbox and former engine. But Stavanovic was also stumped here, as instead of the FIA awarding him an entry with the ex-Toyota entry, they gave this to Peter Sauber after he took on the remnants of the BMW Sauber team, which reportedly Zoran Stefanovic was absolutely fuming about, as not only had he managed to purchase the rights of the engine and the chassis from Toyota, but he'd also taken on a load of their staff when they got made redundant from the F1 project in Cologne. So, so far, this is the fourth rejection that Stefanovic had happened in 96 and 97 during the process of 2009 to get on the 2010 grid and then purchasing Toyota's remnants to try and get in through the back door for 2010. But as I mentioned, he's not a man that likes the word no and he attempted again during the 2010 Italian Grand Prix to enter the sport for 2011 as he was one of 15 entries that were submitted but yet again he was rejected. He also tried again with another attempt to enter F1 in 2015 and it seems the last we ever heard of him was in 2017 when he tried to announce plans to enter the sport in 2019 where this time he said he had the infrastructure and the personnel in place to enter a team based from Parma which was also around the time that a team was reportedly being backed significantly with Chinese money for an entry to the sport for the 2019 season. The really comical thing is if he managed to get on the grid with the Toyota assets is he had a deal lined up with Kazuki Nakajima who was going to be on loan from Toyota but he was also going to bring back former world champion Jack Villeneuve and have his reserve driver reportedly as Pastor Maldonado 
who as we know would later on in his career go on to win one race for Williams in Spain. But despite the multiple attempts, Stefan Grand Prix seems to be an F1 team that's never going to make it to the grid, as on multiple occasions the FIA seem to have had reservations about never allowing them on the grid. And then just as a token on the end, I thought I'd put one team that did actually make it to the grid, embarrassingly so, and disappeared shortly after, and that's Mastercard Lola Formula 1 team. This is a team that were backed by the might of Mastercard, and the cars were designed and engineered by engineering giant Lola Cars. Yet they managed to turn up for the 1997 season in Australia, with a car that was an absolute disaster and 11 seconds off the pace with their two drivers Vincenzo Sospiri and Ricardo Rosset. And unfortunately that seems to be where the issues only just started, as it was announced in March ahead of the Brazilian Grand Prix that the team wasn't going to be appearing in Brazil and was withdrawing from the championship, with reasons cited as technical and financial difficulties. And in just that one jaunt in Formula 1 in Australia, the team managed to go into receivership with debts amounting to £6 million and the Lola Car Company ended up being picked up by Irish entrepreneur Martin Bahrain and Lola have never made an attempt to enter F1 ever again. So those are the teams that I remember recently trying to get onto the F1 grid with failed success. And an honourable mention should go to David Richards and his Pro Drive organisation, as realistically they should have been entitled to an F1 entry, as Pro Drive were highly successful in both sports cars and the World Rally Championship with Subaru. And it wasn't through a lack of investment or lack of organisation that this team never made it, as this was purely because they rubbed everyone up the wrong way, by announcing that they were going to be an outright McLaren customer team running year-old chassis and engines and having Gary Paffitt, the McLaren young driver and test driver, as their lead driver. This didn't go down too well at the time, as it was before all of the open resources like you get now in F1 with customer parts. And so the entry was refused flat out, and ProDrive never made an appearance. But let us know in the comments below what you think of these proposed entries failing it to make the F1 grid. And as always, thank you very much for watching one of our videos. And please don't forget, as always, to like the video and subscribe to the channel for future Formula 1 content.